here uh, before you this morning to start our gospel meeting. I'm excited to be here. I'm blessed that uh, each and every one of you are here as well. Uh, the theme is going to be profiting from the prophets. So we're going to be looking uh, at each uh, sermon that we have at an individual uh, prophet and lessons we can learn uh, from that prophet or the book that bears that prophet's name. And this morning, uh, we're going to be looking at our duty as watchmen. And as uh, we look at the prophets, uh, usually they're divided into two sections, the major prophets and the minor prophets. Uh, and of course, uh, that delineation between those two is really not in a statement so much on uh, the material, but on the length of the material. So those major prophets have longer books, the minor prophets have shorter books. But in uh, Ezekiel, you might be turning into Ezekiel chapter 3. I want to paint a, a picture for you here in the time that we have this morning. Imagine a storm is coming. All of the forecasts indicate that it can produce an F5 tornado with baseball-sized hail. And as you are listening to these forecasts, you're in your house, you hear a shrill, loud siren. And it is the tornado siren. You hurry down to your basement, you hunker down, you get away from the windows. And the storm passes and you are safe. But as you go back outside to assess the damage, you see that a lot of your neighbors didn't take the warning. Their houses are destroyed. There's no sign of life. What a tragedy. Why didn't they heed the warning? And as you listen to the radio, maybe you turn on your cell phone, you read report about a town that was in the path of the tornado, but the alarm never went off. That tornado siren that you heard never happened in their town. And that entire town was wiped out. We think about how tragic that would be. And while this particular story is made up, it has a very spiritual lesson for all of us. In Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 17, there God tells Ezekiel, son of man, I've made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. And we see that God had tasked the prophet Ezekiel with being a watchman. We need to understand exactly what is a watchman. Now, I'm curious, who in this audience would like to define what a watchman is? And I do like an interactive class. I normally teach on Sunday morning, so uh, feel free uh, to either raise your hand or if you want to, just pop an answer out there. What do you think a watchman is? A guard? Absolutely, that's a good one. We have another one back here? Somebody that watches. Well, there's your good definition. It is a lookout. It is a sentry or a sentinel, a guard, one that would spy or would keep watch. And usually these watchmen were stationed on a high wall. They were on a tower. They were in a place where they had some elevation so that they could be able to see a large distance. I want to give you some examples of physical watchmen. Turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 18. 2 Samuel chapter 18, there we see a watchman in the time of David. Now this is after uh, Absalom has been killed, and now there's some messengers coming back. But in 2 Samuel chapter 18, beginning in verse 24, it said, And David sat between the two gates, and the watchman went up to the roof over the gate unto the wall, and lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man running alone. And the watchman cried and told the king. The king said, If you be alone, there is tidings in his mouth. He came apace and drew near. The watchman saw another man running, and the watchman called unto the porter and said, Behold, another man running alone. And the king said, He also bringeth tidings. And the watchman said, Methinketh the running of the foremost is like the running of Ahimeaz, the son of Zadok. And the king said, He is a good man and cometh with good tidings. So here we see the watchman sees a messenger coming, and he alerts the king. He lets the king know somebody is coming. There's a messenger or messengers coming. We see another example in 2 Kings chapter 9. 2 Kings chapter 9. There uh, with Jehu approaching the king Joram. We see in verse 17 and following. And there stood a watchman on the tower in Jezreel, and he spied the company of Jehu as he came, and said, I see a company. And Joram said, Take an horseman and send to meet them, and let him say, Is it peace? So there went one on horseback to meet him, and said, Thus saith the king, Is it peace? Jehu said, What hast thou to do with peace? Turn thee behind me. 
The watchman told, saying, The messenger came to them, but he cometh not again. Then he sent out a second on horseback, which came to them, and said, Thus saith the king, Is it peace? And Jehu answered, What hast thou to do with peace? Turn thee behind me. And the watchman told, saying, He came even unto them, and cometh not again. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he driveth furiously. We see a similar type situation here. A messenger is coming, or in this case, Jehu is coming to Joram to wipe out the house of Ahaz, as the Lord had anointed him to do. We see in both of these examples, the watchmen knew who they were looking at. You know, in the first one, uh, that watchman said, well, that running looks like a particular individual. And in this one, well, that looks like Jehu that's coming. So file that one back in your memory banks. We'll come back to that. The watchman had the primary responsibility to alert others about impending danger. We're going to spend some time now in Ezekiel chapter 33. Turn over there in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 33, and we're going to read the first three verses. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people. Now, what is the sword of reference to here in this passage? Are we talking about a literal massive sword that's coming upon the land? What is that talking about? What do you think? Well, what was the sword used for in those days? Wartime, exactly right. Uh, it is a reference to war, a reference to conflict or a battle. In other words, when you see a battle coming, you see the army coming, watchmen, you better blow the trumpet, give them warning. And we know what a trumpet is. It's an instrument that is used for signaling. It gives a loud and a distinct sound. You know, there wasn't any mistaking what the sound of the trumpet was. The people would know what that sound meant. But notice in verse number 6, if the watchman failed to warn others, he was held personally responsible if anybody perished. Verse number 6 of Ezekiel 33. But if the watchmen see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. You see, that person was still guilty. They still deserved that punishment. But the watchman had an obligation to warn them about that. You know, this is a very serious thing. As we realize God is speaking to Ezekiel here, and God would be the one that would hold uh, Ezekiel in this case, or the watchman in general, responsible for those people that lost their life when they did not blow that trumpet. I want you to turn over to Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28 and see just who we need to fear. Now, this is Jesus speaking to the 12 apostles, telling them not to be afraid of man but to rather fear God. And here's the reason why. He said in Matthew 10 and verse 28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Well, who is the him in the latter part of that passage? Who is the one that can destroy not only the physical body, but the eternal spirit? God, and God only. And when you look at that word hell in the King James Version of the Bible, sometimes it's the underlying word talking about Hades, the unseen realm of the dead. But in this case, it is the word Gehenna. So we are talking about the final place of all wicked people, wicked spirits, Satan. We're talking about Gehenna. And this is a reference to the Hinnom Valley. It was a ravine. That was in Jerusalem where they would take the trash and the garbage and they would burn it perpetually. So there was always fire, always smoke rising from that. And that's the image that we should get. It's eternal fire, eternal suffering. That's the hell that's being mentioned here in this passage. But I want you to see that the watchman was directly responsible for the safety of the people that he was to warn. Well, that's the physical watchman. The prophets, as we study the prophets this week, were God's spiritual watchmen. You know, the nations of Israel and Judah, we know they were divided at the time of the prophets here, departed from God often. And when they had departed, they were judged by him. The prophets were God's warning system to the wicked. And there was a purpose for that. Look at verse number 7 now of Ezekiel 33. 
It says, So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. Very reminiscent of Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 17. Somewhat a parallel passage. He was warning them so that they could repent. And we hear oftentimes that God is a God of love. And he absolutely is a God of love. But he is also a just God. He will punish the wicked. But this passage shows us very clearly that God is a loving God. He gave the people ample time to repent and to be able to avoid that punishment. Notice that he sent messenger after messenger, prophet after prophet, to warn these people. Why would he do that if he didn't love the people? If he didn't want the people to change? But how did the people treat these messengers? How did they treat the prophets? Look at Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. Jesus speaking here. He says, beginning in verse 34 of Matthew 23. Wherefore, behold, I send you unto you prophets and wise men and scribes. Now watch what they did. And some of them ye shall kill and crucify. And some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. Now skip down to verse 37. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. So here is God sending messenger after messenger, prophet after prophet, an effort to get them to repent. In fact, as you study the prophets, both major and minor, you will see a theme repeated throughout all of those books, and that is repentance. Prophets were there to try and turn the people away from wickedness and back to God. And yet, how did the people treat these people? They killed them. In fact, Stephen said the same thing in Acts chapter 7 and verse 52. He says, In rebuking the Jews there, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, speaking of Jesus, and then he points the finger right back at them. He says, Of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. It wasn't enough that they just killed the prophets and the messengers. They also killed God's only begotten son. We know their reaction to that was incorrect. But God had loved them. He had sent the messengers. He had sent his son in an effort to get them to change. But I want you to notice that when the people rejected the warning, the watchman gave the warning, he sounded the alarm, they were held responsible. That punishment came and they were destroyed. You flip back over to Matthew 23 and look at verse number 38. Jesus there says, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. You know, in AD 70, when Jerusalem uh, was destroyed, it was destroyed. Not one stone left remaining on that temple. God had wiped it out. He had judged them. But in Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse 9, notice, he says, Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way... He shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. You see, that wicked person would still be lost if they didn't heed the warning. But the watchman that warned would save his soul. He would be spared. That's an important lesson for us to understand. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. A principle that we need to understand as Christians is that we have a responsibility to plant the seed. That is, to teach the word and to cultivate that, to water it. But it is God that gives the increase. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 6, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. But we have that responsibility to teach and to preach the gospel, to go back and to cultivate if we need to, but it's going to be God that gives the increase. So we want to make sure that as watchmen, we are doing our duty in that regard. But I want you to see in Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse 8, that the spiritual watchman, just like the physical watchman, could also fail in his duties to warn there in verse number 8 of Ezekiel 33, it says, When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. 
If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Oh, again, the watchman failed to warn. The people died in their sins. Not only would those people be lost, but that watchman too would be held responsible for that. You know, there's an adage when you go to the movies that silence is golden. You ever seen that before? Heard that? When it comes to the watchman, silence is not always golden. You know, I've been accused of hate speech before and trying to turn somebody from their wickedness. But sometimes the most hateful speech that you can have towards somebody that is lost is saying nothing at all. Silence is not always golden. We need to warn those that are going down the wrong path that there's judgment coming. And so we need to be very mindful of that, as the watchman did. You know, we sometimes will make the excuse that, well, the, the people don't want to hear it. You know, they're, they're not going to like me, or they might call me names, or, or any other thing that we could come up with. But I want you to see the people that Ezekiel had to go to. Look at Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 3 through 7, and see if this sounds like somebody you would like to go talk to. Ezekiel chapter 2, beginning in verse 3. And he said unto me, this is God speaking to Ezekiel, Son of man, I sent thee to the children of Israel. Now watch how they're described. To a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me even unto this very day. For they are impudent children and stiff-hearted. I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, and they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are rebellious house. Are you noticing a word that's repeated? Rebellious. Yet shall they know that there hath been a prophet among them. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee. And thou dost dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. What was that key word? Rebellious. You're going to a people, Ezekiel, that aren't going to want to hear what you have to say to them. They don't want to listen. They don't want to change. But what did God require Ezekiel to do? Speak. You go. Friends, we live in a country where Christianity is not very popular. Saying the right thing, doing the right thing is not looked upon as very popular. Not looked upon as the right thing. There are those that call good evil and evil good. But we still need to go. We need to be the example. We need to be the influence for those individuals. Ezekiel still had to go and warn. Well, that's good and all for Ezekiel. What does that have to do with us? Well, when we realize in the New Testament times, we are God's watchmen. We are God's alert system. You know, before Jesus Christ ascended back up to heaven, he gave his great commission. Recorded in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, as well as Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. And I would imagine most of you know exactly what that says. The fact that we have to go out into all the world to teach and to preach the gospel, to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then not only that, but to teach them to observe all the things which Christ in that case had taught the apostles. And we know that that is a regenerative command. It was to be taught to each successive generation. So that command is still in effect for us today. And I want you to notice he uses the word teach, teaching, as well as preaching. And part of all of those things is warning. You know, we can't teach and preach without also warning. But warning of what? What is coming down the road? Who has the answer for that? What is coming? Judgment. There is a great day coming, as we sometimes see. You know, it's going to come swiftly and without announcing it. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. There the apostle Peter wrote, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And I sometimes joke, here's your global warming. This is it. The earth is not going to be renovated. It is going to be destroyed in fire when the Lord comes again. All that is in it. You know, I don't want to be on the earth when that happens. I want to be with the Lord. I trust that's where you want to be as well. 
You know, we don't know when this day is coming. Look at Matthew chapter 24. Toward the end of this chapter, uh, Jesus uh, prophesying really about the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, but then he shifts over to that final day. In verse number 36, he says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And then we look in verse 42, a command that he requires of us. He says, Watch, therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. And then verse 44, he says, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. What are some key words in those passages? What's one of them? Watch. What's the other one? Ready. Watch and ready. What do those two words mean? If I say you need to watch something, what does it require? Looking? Yeah. Eyes open, right? You have to be alert. You have to be looking. You can't be asleep, in other words. What about ready? What does it mean to be ready? Be prepared. Yeah, exactly. Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. I don't have the time uh, to go through this particular parable, but that is the parable of the ten virgins. You know, there were five that were foolish, and there were five that were wise. What was the difference between those that were wise and those that were foolish? Wise were prepared. Now, they still had the lamp, did they not? And they still had oil in the lamp. They were at the right place, weren't they? But what happened? That bridegroom, he tarried, didn't he? And the oil in their lamps went out. And they didn't have extra, did they? The wise brought the extra because they were prepared, weren't they? They saw there might be a possibility that the bridegroom is going to delay, and I need to make sure I'm ready. Because when the others were told to go out and to buy, guess who came? The bridegroom. And they were shut out. We don't want that to be us. We need to be ready. And to be ready means to be prepared and because we don't know when the Lord comes again, that means we need to be ready what? Always. Always. We need to be a prepared people always. Now we know this judgment is going to be based upon what we have done in our bodies. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. Very plain passage. It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Again, simple, easy to understand. How we live our life, the things that we do now, are going to impact final judgment, whether they are good or whether they are bad. The Apostle Paul mentions a similar thing in Romans chapter 14 and verse 10, the fact that we all are going to have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. But you know, we sing that song, There's a Great Day Coming. We know there are several stanzas to that song. And truly, it will be a great day for those that are faithful to the Lord. But there's also a stanza in there that says it will be a what kind of day? A sad day. Sad day for who? For those that know not the Lord, that do not obey Him. You see, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 and 9, we'll flip over there to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 and 9, paints that picture. It says unto you who are troubled, rest with us. The Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And friends, that's a sad day. I don't want anybody to have to experience that that I can warn. And that should be our mission as well as Christians. That should be our attitude toward those that are lost. And we have to realize the day of judgment is going to be greater than any physical calamity that has happened in the history of this earth. The consequences are eternal. Look at Matthew chapter 25. We'll look at verses 31 through 33 of Matthew 25. Jesus says there, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, speaking of His second coming, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats, and He shall set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. And if you look at verse 34, where are the sheep headed? Heaven. They're headed to heaven. When you go down... The verse uh, number 41 
Those that are on the left hand, the goats, are going to hear, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. We see its eternal consequences. So God has given us the ability to see this judgment coming in advance. We're not ignorant of the fact that it is coming. We don't know when it's coming, but we know of a surety. It is coming. So what are we doing with that opportunity? You know, we must warn the lost of impending judgment. Turn over to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. This is Christ in his Sermon on the Mount. He says of Christians, Ye are the salt of the earth. This is verse 13 of Matthew 5. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. So Christians are salt. Well, what is salt used for? Flavoring, seasoning, what else? Preserving, that's right. Before they had refrigeration or discovered refrigeration, what did they do? They would salt it to preserve their food. And so Christians, very much the same way. We're there flavoring the world, if you will, with, with the things that are right and good. But we're also preserving the world. And how do we preserve the world? We have to teach, right? We have to have that good and positive influence. We have to warn. But notice, we're not only salt, we're also light. He says, beginning in verse 14, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And what is our light a reference to there? What does light do anyway? It illuminates, that's right. It shines. And the world is likened to darkness. Sin and those that are in sin in darkness, light illuminated by the light, Jesus Christ. You can look at John chapter 1, the first nine verses, uh, as well as other parts of uh, the book of John and 1 John. Highlight very clearly that Jesus is the light. We're the reflectors of Jesus, showing that influence upon the world. And so that is one way in which we can warn as well. I want you to notice we are also preachers of righteousness. In Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 17, the Apostle Paul, writing to the Romans, said, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, some like to stop there and just say, Call on the Lord, say the sinner's prayer, what have you, I can be saved. But they stop short, because the Apostle Paul tells you exactly what this means. He says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? No so belief is a requirement. He continues, And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? So they have to hear something. Hear what? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So there has to be somebody there to preach and to teach. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. See, there's something you have to do with it. Obedience is required. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So there's our source right there. We have to understand the word of God. We have to be able to communicate the word of God to those that are lost and dying in sin. Well, I want to give you a few ways on how you can be a good watchman. We understand that there is a requirement to be a watchman, to be right with God. But how can we be a good watchman? We don't want to be that watchman that doesn't warn individuals because we know the consequences of that. We, along with the people, will be lost, that we do not warn. You know, God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, and he wishes all to repent. Look at Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse 11. You know, this is an important point. Because I've had some people uh, mention to me as I've studied with them and discussed them that, you know, uh, the fact that God would send somebody to the eternal destruction in hell, you know, that, that's sadistic. And when you look up that word sadistic, it means pleasure in the pain of others. And friends, that's not at all accurate about God. Look at verse 11. It says, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? Does God have any pleasure in the wicked dying? No, he does not. 
He wants all to do what? To repent, to change. Look at Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31. This is uh, the Apostle Paul speaking at Mars Hill, talking to individuals that were incredibly idolatrous. In fact, there was a Roman satirist uh, that talked about the city of Athens, said it was easier to find a god, little g, in the city of Athens than it was to find a man. Just how given over to idolatry they were. Now in Acts 17 and verse 30 it says, In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to do what? Repent. Why? Verse 31. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Who will be the judge? Jesus Christ and his word. But he wants all men to repent. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 mentions this very clearly. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. And that is precisely why God has entrusted his servants, Christians, to go out into all the world and to teach the gospel to those that are lost and dying in sin. Because he wants all men to be saved. He wants them to repent of their wickedness. But we have to ask a question. If we are to be God's watchmen, and we are to be good watchmen, just what are we watching? You know, the watchman needs to have his eyes focused for all threats that may be on the horizon. Just like that physical watchman, the examples that we looked at, what were they watching out for? Watching out for armies that are approaching? They're watching out for messengers that are approaching? And as I mentioned, in both of those examples, they knew at least one of the individuals that was coming, or at least they had a good idea that's who it was. They knew who their audience was. Who is out there lurking like a lion in the streets? Satan is, that's right. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, he's our adversary. We are to be sober, to be diligent, to be watchful because Satan's out there. He's just waiting to consume a Christian. You know, the threats we are looking for are not so much physical, are they? What are they? They're spiritual threats. And therefore, we have to turn to the source by which we learn of the spiritual. And what is that source? The Word of God, that's right. God's Word. You know, this means that we have to have regular, in-depth Bible study. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. I'm certain you know what this passage says. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. What is the charge that Paul is giving Timothy in this passage? Yeah, you got to study, right? You've got to study the Word of God. You've got to study it correctly. You've got to be diligent in that study. It's not just reading, although reading is important, but you have to have some sweat in it, you know. Sometimes you study the Bible, you get a little sweat on your brow. You know, sometimes the mental side of it is we have to be diligent in our studies. I think about 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13. There the Apostle Paul would tell to Timothy, he says, Till I come, give attendance and he says three things, to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. What was it that Timothy was reading? Anyway? What do you think? Yeah. Now, he didn't have the Bible completed at that point, but Old Testament, right? They had scripture, to exhortation, to encouragement, and then to doctrine. What's another word for doctrine? Teaching. Exactly right, teaching. Notice he had to give attention to these things. You remember what the noble Bereans were doing in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11? What were they doing? Searching the scriptures daily. I think that is simply amazing because who was their teacher? Yeah, the Apostle Paul. We know it was the Apostle Paul, an inspired man of God, and yet what were they doing? They were searching the scriptures daily. How much more for a non-inspired man such as myself teaching you this morning? Should we search the scriptures daily? daily. Don't take my word for it. Look in the Bible. Make sure it is right. And if I have said anything that is incorrect, please let me know. I don't want to lead you down the wrong path. And no teacher that wants to do what is right wants to lead anybody down the wrong path. We need to be like the noble Bereans. And then also look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11. Friends, if we don't read our Bibles, we don't see the warnings that God has put in there, 
We are ignorant of Satan's devices. There in 2 Corinthians says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. But we don't want to be ignorant of his devices. Why? If I'm ignorant of Satan out here, I'm vulnerable, aren't I? I can very easily be attacked by him. You know, that's why in Ephesians chapter 6, we're required to put on the whole armor of God. And guess what the sword is? It's the Word of God. And outside of the sword, all of that armor is defensive. And it was all designed to protect the front of the soldier. Not much on the back, if anything. That tells us we face our threats forward. Face them. But we have to be armed. We do not want to be spiritually naked in that regard. You know this is going to require time and dedication. We have to ask ourselves the question, how are we using our time? Are we redeeming our time? If you look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 16, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he says, Redeeming the time because the days are evil. What does it mean to redeem? Yeah, take back or buy back. In other words, buy back the time. Spend your time wisely. And as I've said uh, before in, in my teachings at Park Street when I've had classes, I've mentioned the fact that we all have 24 hours in a day. Now, we know our lifespans are going to vary somewhat, but we have 24 hours in the day. How are we using that time? How are we prioritizing that time? These are lessons we have to think about. You know, is our time spent in pursuing the fleshly things of this life? You know, Satan has a lot of ways that he can blind us. He can use all sorts of different ways. He can use social media. He can use the Internet. He can use sports. He can use TV. There's countless ways that he can blind us, that he can turn the blind eye, so to speak, for the watchman. But our spiritual eyesight needs to be clear. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. Notice how important it is that our spiritual eyesight is clear. It says, therefore, we walk by faith not by sight. And from Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, how do we give faith? Come by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Therefore, we've got to get right back into the Word so that our spiritual vision is clear. But just as those others, watchmen that I mentioned, knew their audience, we need to know our audience. Who is it that we are to warn? Who are we warning? Well, look at Ezekiel chapter 3 now, verses 18 and 19. Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. It says, When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. What is one audience, if you will, that we are to warn? The wicked, the lost, those that are spiritually lost and dying in the world, perhaps have never heard the gospel. We have that primary responsibility to be able to warn them. But I want you to also look at verses 20 and 21 of Ezekiel 3. Because there's another group. He says again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness which he hath done shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live. Because he is warned, also thou hast delivered thy soul. Well, who's this second group? Yeah, we got those that were righteous, but uh-oh, something happened, right? They turned away from their righteousness. But we have the responsibility to warn brothers and sisters that have gone astray. You know, the stumbling block he mentions there, that represents divine judgment awaiting them in the future. Because guess what? That day of judgment is coming for those that used to be righteous, but turned away from it. In other words, they apostatize, which apostasy is very real. This doctrine of once saved, always saved is nonsense. It's not true. It's a false doctrine. You have to continue walking in the light as Jesus is in the light if we want to have salvation. You know, the watchman sees this happening. He sees this stumbling block. He sees the brother, the sister in Christ, hurtling toward it. And he needs to sound the alarm. He needs to warn them. 
Look at Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. The New Testament makes this very clear. We have this responsibility. There, Paul said, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. What's the requirement here? Who are those that are spiritual? Well, those are those that are following after Christ. Are they? they see one overtaken in a fault. They need to go after him. Restore them. Warn them. Try and bring them back. What reason? Well, could you not be in that situation sometime? Yes, you could. It's very clear and possible that you could fall away. And would you not want your brother or sister in Christ to come and to rescue you? To try and get you back on the right path? I'd say every one of us would want that. But also look at James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. James 5, 19 and 20. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his ways shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sin. That idea of conversion, bringing them back where they need to be, right with God. We have that responsibility. I want you to look at Ezekiel 33 again, verses 12 through 13 now. Because I want you to see that past righteousness will not save if one lives in sin. There in verses 12 and 13 of Ezekiel 33, it says, Therefore thou son of man, say unto the children of thy people, The righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turneth from his wickedness. Neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteousness in the day that he sinneth. When I shall say to the righteous that he shall surely live, if he trust to his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousnesses shall not be remembered, but for his iniquity that he hath committed, he shall die for it. We need to keep that very much in our minds. Are we actively warning those that have gone astray? We are being a good watchman, we must. We also need to make the message loud and clear as we draw to a close. You know, the physical watchman, he had that trumpet. As I mentioned, it gave a loud, distinct sound. The people understood the sound of that trumpet and what it meant. You know, so it must be with the spiritual watchman. We need to let people know about the day of judgment and the means by which they can be saved from it. And we need to do it clearly, and we need to do it loudly. I don't mean we go out and we yell at people. I mean the message has to be clear. No mincing of words. You know... Are our trumpets muted? Are we only teaching some of the counsel of God? Are we concerned that we're going to offend somebody? So we decide to say nothing at all, even though they get closer and closer to that eternal judgment. You know, any of those things aren't going to get the message across. You know, a watered-down gospel is not going to convict or convert anyone. We'll leave you with Acts chapter 2, verses 36 and 37. There, Peter, giving this gospel sermon on the day of Pentecost, a convicting sermon. He says, Therefore, all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. I want you to notice what it did. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. They said unto Peter, the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter did not mince words. He placed the blame for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ solely on them. That this is what you did. And it convicted them. And we see that about 3,000 souls were converted to Christ because that message was loud and it was clear. You know, when Stephen preached in Acts 7, verses 52 and 54, it also convicted, but they had the inappropriate response as they gnashed on him with their teeth and they stoned him. You know, sometimes, as we see in Jude 22 and 23, we need to yank folks out of the fire for their own good. What will it be today? We know there's a great day coming. We know it's going to result in eternal punishment for the wicked. Are we alerting those that are heading down that path? Or are we being quiet? I hope and I pray that you will be good watchmen. That you will be like Ezekiel was required to do to warn those that are lost and dying in sin. Perhaps it's a brother and sister in Christ that have departed from the faith. Let's go after them. Let's be those shining examples. Let's be the salt of the earth. Let's be the light of the world. Let's be good watchmen.
I thank you all so very much for your attention, your thoughts and comments this morning.